Hello, dreamers, and welcome back on this rainy, drizzly afternoon. Sad sky machines are weeping to drown the world's sorrows and cleanse it, reinvigorating everything. Hmm. Strange. It seemed as though time slowed down after I closed the cover on this tome the last time we were together. Did you notice? Everything sort of stopped for a moment. I guess stories can do that sometimes. Slow everything down to a crawl. So you can step outside of yourself and become someone else entirely. Notice the little things in life. Anyhow, I'm glad I caught up with the book. It vanished not long after our last meeting. It was almost as though it sprouted legs and ran away. It has now reappeared, as I have need of it. Very strange. Very strange. So just to recap, the last time we started our journey, and we watched as tragedy struck, and a ghostly orphan child fled into a murky forest filled with dangers and wonders. We made some new friends, and some new enemies, perhaps. So now, let's pick up where we left off and see where the Dream Stars takes us next, shall we? Let's turn the page. Chapter 2, Gladiola, Our Eternal Dance. A memory of the moment startles the sun bear awake like an arrow striking him deeply in the posterior. It unfurls with a long, slow breath, as though a desperate, dying message were being whispered to him from the past. Tiny silver talons scratched his hindquarters as the hostile redbird swooped down to attack. The assault left behind a burning mark. He had been branded. Then the pain subsided. The wounds seeped and tainted drops of blood burrowed like silver worms into his skin. The lasting signature signed by the Redbird is a star-shaped scar. During his frustrating struggle in the brambles earlier, Sunbear had been issued this injury, but he'd forgotten all about it until now. It was the lingering sense of dread that woke him. He snuffles and licks at the scar. I have not yet even tried to fall asleep. Quite frankly, I am not the least bit tired. I've spent several hours carefully pulling dozens of thorns out of Sunbear's snout. He had dozed off while mumbling only a few moments into the story of she who sleeps beyond the stars. He snores like a jackhammer. It's a wonder that he can sleep through his own noises. I noticed the scar while he was snoozing. I passed my hand over it, but Gleam did not heal the laceration like it had all the other little cuts and abrasions on his blunt nose. There is something different about this wound. For some reason that I cannot explain, it makes me very, very sad. Sunbear looks back at me for a moment. His eyes well up and his fat lower lip quivers, his brow furrows with troubling thoughts. It, it uses your fear, you know. He whispers to me. It uses fear against you. Your anger. Your jealousy. All of your unfavorable emotions. It uses them to find you. And to torment you. Then, it takes control of you. At that moment... The big fellow begins to cry. <laughs> Sunbear closes his eyes tightly, trying to endure the pain, but he is unable to hold back his misery. His eyes spring leaks and they begin gushing streams of salty sadness. He blubbers, pawing over the spots on his nose where the prickles had been lodged. Gleam has magically mended the punctures, but his proboscis remains itchy and sore. His tears start to collect forming a mud puddle in the softening ground. Poor Sun Bear, you will drown the world with so many tears. I pet his gnarly fur and attempt to comfort him, 
but he is consumed by a deepening sorrow. He sniffs and gurgles, desperately floundering in his drops as he strains to surface from the depths of his despair. It's just too difficult for him. The puddle continues to grow, and it swirls with reflections of the surrounding woods. That's when something occurs to me, amid my furry friend's woeful weeping. I don't know what I look like. I have never once gazed upon my own face. Up until the moment I entered into this world, I had seen everything through the eyes of my mother. Whenever she looked into a mirror, it was her beautiful reflection I would see. I do not have a name, but I can at least have a face, a sense of my own identity, can't I? But then, why do I feel so afraid to look? What will I see? Cautiously, I approach the puddle. Sunbear slumps back down onto his mossy plot. He appears to have cried himself back to sleep for now, so I tiptoe past his snout and stand at the edge of the bright pool. It shimmers like silver glass and ripples with each of Sunbear's labored breaths. I peer into the puddle, but it is too ripply to see my reflection. Something within me, a hushed voice, whispers that I should promptly drop my ruby heirloom into the puddle. Before I can even question my impulse, I have already done its bidding. Gleam kerplunks into the limpid pool, sinking out of my sight, and the rippling water instantly clears. I can see myself looking back at me. I hear a distant drum and tumultuous sounds of birds and angels' trumpets. Nature is professing an undying love for me celebrating that which has been remade from its ruins. I feel a great surge of power in seeing and thereby knowing myself. A gentle glowing rain begins to fall, made of my own joyful tears, cascading down in the shapes of those same tiny silver fish. This is my kingdom. All of the sacred life in this forest bows before me. I call for more rain to fall, and at my command, it begins to pour. I raise my arms in triumph, then I close my eyes and imagine. She awakens, a girl, nearly thirteen golden and enchanting like her enigmatic mother, escaping from her recurring childhood nightmares. A flood of mythic proportions had swept away her home and all of her poor loved ones. She was helpless to stop it. She is drenched in sweat as are her crimson bedsheets. Reactively, she rubs her ruby ring, which is covered in beads of condensation for some reason. She mumbles a kind of incantation and wishes the nightmares away. She takes a deep, relieving breath. It was just a bad dream after all. She looks around her untidy room, acknowledging her collection of things that make her dwelling feel like home. Her books, her guitar, old stuffed animals worn soft in spots that have been carefully restitched after years of aggressive snuggling. Her fishbowl with her solitary goldfish, Grupa, who is sluggishly drifting around in concentric circles, listless, waiting for the next feeding time. And, most importantly, her desk full of unfinished writings. All of these curiosities help to calm her restless mind and bring her back to the safety of reality. What comforts her best of all, though, is Gleam, her birthstone passed down through seven generations of the sage women in her family. Made from holes shot through the moon, her grandmother had once said. The hexagonal red gem is set in a golden band that coils around the third finger of her writing hand three and a half times. It's like a possessive serpent clutching and protecting its brilliant ruby egg. She can see her reflection warp and stretch in its many facets. She was told by her mother 
never to take it off. When she asked her why, her mother simply said, Because, because it's, it's important. important. So, she promised never to remove it. She'd worn it so long now that without it, she would feel rather naked. Some things are like that. Over time, they become a part of us. Abruptly, her stomach turns and she feels queasy. She leaps out of bed and heads for her bathroom, certain that she is going to be sick. Out of the corner of her eye, she catches a glimpse of a red flicker darting past her bedroom window, through which the morning sun is streaming in conical shafts of yellow light. Her bare feet cross the threshold from the plushy blue carpeting of her bedroom onto the cold, teal-tiled floor of her adjoining bathroom. There is a spiraling symbol above her mirror, carved into its wooden frame. She focuses on it, and her nausea slowly begins to melt away. She grabs hold of both sides of her porcelain sink and raises her head to look into the mirror. She appears haggard, like she's not slept in a month. The nightmares must have really taken their toll this time. Her eyes are both baggy and sunken in. She is ghostly pale. What bothers her the most, though, is the sudden appearance of silvery gray streaks all through her tawny blonde locks. I'm just a kid, she thinks. I shouldn't have any gray hairs. She opens the mirror, which conceals a medicine cabinet, and fumbles forth a pair of uncanny green scissors, vainly intent on snipping away the discolored strands from the untamable forelocks of her flaxen mane. But before she can cut a single one away, a disturbingly silky voice reverberates through her mind. Oh, don't cut the silver from your hair, because I happen to like it there. The voice is eerily familiar to her. She closes the medicine cabinet, and her eyes meet with a jarring sight. Her reflection has changed into a shadowy specter, and it is leering angrily at her. She trembles with fear. Is she hallucinating from lack of sleep? Is this another nightmare from which she has yet to wake? She has, on rare occasions, experienced dreams within dreams, but this doesn't feel like those did. With those dreams, there came no questions. The silver strands of her hair begin to wriggle away from her scalp, dropping into the sink. One by one they transform into tiny silver fish and squirm down the drain. In a flash, her dark reflection reaches out with icy cold hands and pulls her through the mirror. She floats through the abyssal void of space and time, eye to eye with her nemesis, her doppelganger. She can see her own shifting reflection repeated in her shadow's unsettling gaze. She is aging and can feel the intense pains of physical growth. The terror of displacement is stealing years of her life. Her fair hair gets longer, her bones creak, and her muscles cramp. I'd, I'd like, like to take a walk, walk behind, behind those, those bright eyes, eyes to, see to see me how you how see me when I see you see looking, looking back at me. The shady specter muses. I am the I am one, one called Lukiat. I, I am the guiding light, 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 the only dream, dream of truth, truth, and the and servant, servant to, to the, the silver, silver stream. stream. The golden-haired girl is stunned. She has no response to what is happening. Her mind has left her. Her memory is a thickening haze. She is completely petrified. She can barely manage to stutter the words. Who, who am I? Well, well then, Lukia twinkles. That, that is the eternal, eternal question, question. Is, is it, it not? not? Who, who am I? I? Who, who do, do you want, want to be? To be? That, that might be a more useful, useful question. question. Or, or even or better. better. Who are we? Aren't you even curious as to the reason why I've come to torment you? We are connected. I knew you when you were young. Your golden locks were shorter then. Spindly legs, those same bright eyes. You have them now. You have them then. She looks away closing her eyes for a moment to try and relieve the sensation of dizziness from freefall. Maybe if she concentrates hard enough, 
she can force herself to wake up from this horrible dream. I assure you, you cannot make me disappear simply by ignoring me, Lukiot says. So, she believes that she has finally come undone, that she is trapped in this vexing, perpetual nightmare forever. Hmm, maybe she is. Lukiat pauses for a cryptic moment, summoning forth a silver cord from the surrounding nebulous vortex. That's it! Yes, that is who you are. Your name, you are she, and she shall you henceforth be called. She is no longer nameless, as it were, and having a title brings her back from the brink of madness. Being called she thins out the haze that is clouding her memory and slowing her reactions. She can feel the power of ages surging through her, and she gets the distinct impression that she has gained the upper hand. Her new moniker is strong, assertive, yet somewhat hollow. For the time being, she feels that it's good enough. Gleam begins to shine ever so brightly. I know everything there is to know about you, she, Lukiat says. But there are many things about yourself that you do not know. Eventually, I will show you when you finally surrender to me and give yourself to the silver stream. When will you learn to let go of whatever you're holding on to? I mean, you might as well. You are barely hanging on as it is. Come, she. Permit me to tie my pretty silver ribbon around you. She sees a glint of hope. The green scissors she unwittingly brought with her through the mirror reappear amid the tempestuous void. They come about and begin drifting towards her. She stretches out to grasp them, and they are magnetically attracted to gleam. As she does this, Lukiat wraps the silver cord around her vulnerable neck. However, with a quick snip, she cuts the cord and sets herself free. Lukiat howls in anger. How dare you forsake the silver stream! At that moment, a dragonfly zips past Lukiat and buzzes in She's ear. Follow me. The mother of trees sent me to ensure that you safely reach the other side. Realizing the alternative is to remain and deal with the angry specter. She dives after the dragonfly, sliding through the vortex at breakneck speed, but with the grace of a butterfly. The void warps into a curved tunnel as she flies. Come back here! You, you cannot, cannot escape, escape from, from me! me. Lukiad screams. Taking on the semblance of a gargantuan crow, the sinister, shape-shifting shadow gives chase. The dragonfly darts towards the spectral light at the end of the tunneling vortex. She can barely keep up. She tucks in and lowers her head, imagining that she is an arrow careening towards its target. She glides twice as fast as before, and within moments she is hovering above a translucent membrane. The dragonfly is waiting there for her. This is the way out. The dragonfly buzzes. She can see now that the illumination on the other side of the membrane is sunlight. Lukiat closes in with black talons gaping. Gleam glints, reminding her of what she is still clutching. She must let go of everything she is holding on to. She makes a split-second decision and tosses the scissors back at her dark pursuer. They fly swift and true. The feathered specter is struck deeply in the left wing. It screeches and flails as it begins spinning out of control. She feels relieved of a tethering weight, as though a bad connection between herself and Lukiat has been severed. Time seems to slow down, and she can perceive many moments within the same instant. She frantically punches at the sinewy surface. She scratches at it with her fingernails, then kicks it as hard as she can, trying to perforate a hole in the fleshy barrier. 
nothing works. I wish I still had those darn scissors, she laments as Lukiat's menacing shadow descends upon her. Lucky for you, the dragonfly responds. I vouch for the finger of fate with my sharpened tail. With those words, the altruistic insect zips about the membrane, slicing a large looping symbol into the filmy surface. The symbol begins to glow, weakening the barrier, and just as Lukiat's dark avian form is about to crash into her from behind, she slips through the opening that's been provided and drops, whistling out of the source and the void into the bright, sunlit realm beyond. She can barely see through the clouds at first, she becomes swathed in wispy, cirrus tufts as she somersaults amid the flocculent sky. The wide expanse gets clearer the farther she falls. Suddenly, a break forms in the obscuring veil. She sees the ocean. She plunges into the salty sea with the force of a star falling from heaven. Shaking off the impact and reorienting herself, she seeks to breach the surface. In desperate need of oxygen, she struggles to swim upward, but instead feels herself sinking like an anchor through the inky blackness. There is a narrow current dragging her downward. It's hopeless. She believes that she is going to drown. So, with due despair, she accepts her fate and takes a big gulp of salt water to end her own suffering. Very unexpectedly, she exhales a twisting stream of bubbles. For a moment, she is confused. How can this be? Then she considers whether this is all a dream or a delusion. It is certainly the most vivid experience she has ever had. Curiously, she notices a red, jewel-encrusted starfish is following her down. It glitters faintly as they sink together and soon it is almost too dark to see. But then her eyes adjust, and slowly the surrounding world comes into glorious focus. There is endless waving turquoise in every direction, and all around her the water is teeming with life. Neon fish, swarms of pulsating jellies, fluorescent octopi, electric eels, shiny crustaceans, and a rainbow wilderness of gem-like coral all paint a vibrant oceanic panorama. She has always been fascinated by the ocean and the deep secrets it holds. She's had many dreams of being at sea, but never before has she taken on the traits of an amphibian. She is startled when her bare feet brush against the sandy bottom. She can bound off of the gritty surface and tread water to propel herself around, but she is still too heavy to surface. The starfish twinkles, crawling ahead of her and revealing a winding trench in the sea floor. She follows it, meandering as a timid thought, navigating the synaptic pathways of a submarine giant's brain. Something about this starfish bothers her, despite its attractive appearance and her instinctive urge to pursue it. Then, approaching quickly through the pelagic pitch, weaving this way and that, a bright, golden-green triangular shape closes in. A gigantic anglerfish with curved teeth and a fluorescent headlamp, but also poisonous purple scales and dorsal spines like those of a lionfish, comes swimming through the murk. It reminds her of her wet pet. Grouper, is that you? She asks. Some bubbles accompany her words. The fish responds in a kindly voice. Clearly you have yet to fully master the use of that red trinket you carry. I'll bet that you are already starting to forget about your fishbowl of life on the other side, aren't you? Memory is a vaguely fluctuant thing. The gemstone carries within it your reflective musings, as well as many memories of those who have possessed it before you. It is difficult, a heavy burden and responsibility, which is why you are sinking. However, 
It also imparts knowledge and the skill of manifestation to its wearer. All of the Dream Stars have special powers. Dream Stars? So this is an elaborate dream then? What exactly are these Dream Stars you speak of? She asks the anglerfish. More bubbles gurgle out with her words. Some of them pop and send out echoes as they rise towards the surface. Before Grouper can answer, a guttural rumbling interrupts from the dark distance. It provokes the bejeweled starfish to glow with a phosphorescent light and spit out a spark of emerald energy that zigzags its way down a trench towards the source of the sound. Grouper's voice becomes grave. That star creature is a sentry, left behind here long ago. It's how the great beast wants for it to pray. It uses others as its eyes and ears. You must make for the surface. You are not safe down here. You must swim directly for the sun. Use your dream star. It will respond to your thoughts. It should obey your commands, though it may take some time to figure out. Unfortunately, time is something in short supply right now. The beast is on its way. Hurry! Use your imagination. For a brief moment, she stops to consider the intensity of all that she has been experiencing. What does everything mean? Aren't our dreams supposedly full of hidden symbols that if aptly deciphered can reveal the truth about our most secret selves? What does this vivid fantasy say about her? The big purple fish just stares at her, perplexed. She rubs the facets of her ruby ring, as if to ask for a clue. Any hint as to why she is here would be helpful. She needs guidance. She receives none. She is adrift in a sea of her own despondence and uncertainty. There is an unnerving pause without any sounds or movement. Then, as though the ring was testing her patience all along, the power of her dream star finally reveals itself. An electric current zips through her body. She contorts and splashes about, flummoxed by a sharp pain in her abdomen. Her legs go numb and wiggly. A cloud of metamorphic blood rises from the deep crimson facets of gleam and swirls around her in gooey ribbons. The plasma wraps about her lower half, pinching her legs together and weaving itself into an adaptive fish tail. Her hair extends and retracts like tendrils, becoming alive and caressing the waters the way tertiary fins would to help a fish maneuver. Her whole body stretches out as overlapping scales emerge to armor over her lower extremities. Her mutated marine form turns buoyant, and she immediately begins swimming upwards towards the sun. Grouper's words return to her mind and fill her with a sense of desperation. If she is truly being hunted, she needs to think fast. She darts through the open ocean, amazed by how quickly she is adapting to her new fishy appendage. The water brightens as she nears the surface. Somewhere in the abyssal deep, a monster has been awakened from its restless slumber. It begins rowing with voracious purpose in the direction of its prey. The hunt has begun. She leaps through the surface of the water with the agility of a dolphin, and then splashes back down into the foamy brine. She pokes her head up above the swelling waves to squint at the sunshine's brilliant splendor. It's becoming covered over by dark, accumulating clouds. For a split second, she forgets what it's like to breathe above water. Treading in a circle and waiting for her eyes to adjust, she can feel the sea roiling tempestuously. Something is disturbing these waters from deep below. Somehow, she can sense it closing in. At that moment, she notices more and more turbulent green clouds collecting on the horizon. They are conspiring to bring about a storm. 
thunder rumbles in the not so far off distance. Something swims by her tail, then another, and another. The storm clouds start blotting out the sun, and she can see quite clearly now that the disturbed water all around her is full of silver fish. She can scarcely form a solid thought, let alone decide on a course of action. The environment behaves in collusion with her growing fear. The surface of the savage sea froths and foams with sinister waves. The sky is brewing, assembling into darkness. Bloated clouds shrivel up and bulge like hearts pumping bloody madness as hairpin quills of lightning rend them agape to spit down their baleful scorn. A pair of violent eyes peel open from within the amassing storm. They are fiercely green and glaring as they infiltrate the lower sky. Two bolts of green lightning burst from out the eyes, streak across the sky, and strike the ground on a meager chunk of land far off to the south. She had not noticed this island before. Was it even there? She can see a tall, dark fin slicing through the nearby waves. It is heading straight for her. She dips down below the water's churning surface to observe what is approaching. This is when she catches her first glimpse of the massive predator that has come to devour her. The dark leviathan growls low. It fixes its terrible gaze upon her vulnerable form, just bobbing there helplessly in the vast ocean. A primal fear overtakes her, and she feels certain that whether this is a dream or not, she is about to die. Grouper rises out of the depths and shatters the tension with an ear-splitting shout. Swim, you daughter! Swim toward the southern triangle! Help for land! I will try to distract the monster! She glances one last time at the burning sun hanging in the sky, behind the thick veil of gathering thunderheads. She considers that this could be the final time she will ever see the light of day, and with that thought, she dives back into the depths and swims for the distant island. The Leviathan rose hard, swishing its enormous tail from side to side. It breaks through waves with its massive body, and its titanic jaw drops open, unleashing row after row of jagged, murderous teeth. Silver fish pour like a fetid breath from its gills and gaping maw. When the lion sheds its golden mane, the shadows are engulfed in flame. Grouper chants these lyrical words and spins in a circle. Its iridescent headlamp emits a light so bright that it temporarily blinds the pursuing beast, giving she a few seconds head start. It does not take very long for the silver fish to catch up with her. They must have sensed her distress, for emotions of that nature conduct quite well through water, even becoming amplified, just like electricity. The silver fish splash around her madly. She can almost hear them thinking, they are in the predator's thrall and supplicant to its dark will. They travel as a collective and attempt to corral her back towards their hungry master. They form themselves into curved walls of undulating silver, but she swims straight through them with the help of gracious gleam. The power of the ruby ring seems to be keeping the silver fish from getting too close to her. Each wiggler that tries to sneak a nibble bounces off of an invisible shield that encapsulates her. Now she is beginning to understand the heirloom's importance. Perhaps she has discovered, or somehow unlocked, the power of her dream star after all. As she swims towards shallower water, she notices that she is not alone in her evasion. All around her, the sea is filling with terrified creatures. She can sense their fear. It is an underwater stampede. Then she hears it. The chill-inducing voice of Lukiat echoes through the water behind her. You have a long way to go before you reach your point of origin. 
you will have to swing strong past all of these other creatures intent on beaching themselves for fear of me. Do you see what pain you are causing others? If you surrender to me, you will be saving hundreds, maybe thousands of lives. Don't be such a selfish fish. Travel back with me to the Silver Stream. Let us continue our eternal dance into the next cycle of creation. End this before it begins. The beast is nearly upon her. Doubt fills her mind. Is she really causing all of this? Should she just give up and let the beast overtake her? That brief moment of hesitation is all that the monster requires. It lurches through the water and opens its jaws to take her. She sees the rows of teeth coming and reacts instinctively. She swishes out of the way and the leviathan rips past her. The monster crashes into the seabed and a cloud of sand, shells, and stone fills the shallows. Unable to see her surroundings, she swims blindly, bouncing between the thick bodies of fleeing whales. The leviathan roars and the obscuring sand settles as though commanded to do so. The beast then recalls the silver fish and refocuses its hungry gaze. She whips her tail with all of her might, pushing hard towards the shoreline. She can almost make out the shelf leading up to the beach now, but there are so many animals surrounding her. The crowd is slowing her down. She attempts to swim around and between them, all the while dodging to avoid being crushed or slapped by a fluke. She grabs onto dorsal fins and tentacles, using them to pull herself through the evacuees and the extraordinary wake they are creating. Gleam provides her with the strength she needs to plow forward. Do you feel the emptiness? Lukia taunts her. The name that I have dubbed you with. It is a mantra that can focus your innate power, but also a shackle that binds you to expectations. She doesn't understand. How can a name, a simple word, both empower and oppress her? Especially since she did not choose it. How can she be of such consequence? Lukiat answers her query. Having her thoughts invaded by this monster is becoming tiresome. It is an absolutism. It defines and ensnares you in a faithful net of truth. It burns like a candle, bright enough to illuminate what lies just ahead of you, yet controlled and therefore too dim to expose the larger mystery. This flame has the potential to start a conflagration if the waxy pricket is tipped over. It can burn away all impurities until only the truth remains. But truth is an assumption. It is the greatest lie of all, for it removes the joy of possibility. It erases our desire to discover ourselves. Lukiat's words are heavy. She can feel their weight slowing her down. It's as though a hex has been placed upon her. The Leviathan attacks her with a renewed determination. It rends asunder anything in its path. The ocean fills with blood and flesh. Within seconds, the monster is on her heels again, and Lukiat's smooth voice drifts through her head. So, you've learned to swim through this big wet dream. How very proud your mother would be of you. Although, I do not think she would approve of the cost. All of their deaths belong to you. Your fear and selfishness has killed you. This is your fault. Monstrous jaws are gaping. She can feel herself being pulled into the beast's widening mouth. She is not strong enough to resist, not even with the help of Gleam. The hellish maw acts as a vacuum and sucks her in. A flood of silver fish envelops her. She twists and squirms to break free as the leviathan closes its powerful jaws to crush her. You belong to me now. It's time to go home. No! She screams, pointing gleam towards the back of the monster's bloody teeth. A concussive blast of energy blooms forth from the magical ring, overpowering the leviathan's faculties and forcing it to beach itself 
and vomit her out onto the sand. Contrary child, what have you done? Look at the terrible mess you've made. The beast snaps at the surf, still chomping away, desperate to eat her. Its massive body is rocking back and forth, unable to retreat into the sea, nor advance onto the land. For a few moments, the sun shines through a break in the storm clouds, and the monster begins melting when it's exposed to the warming radiance. Its gargantuan form shrinks rapidly, and the beast languishes into a slosh of the silver fish it commands. Soon the leviathan is reduced to average size for a shark, and is much less intimidating. She smirks at the pathetic creature as it is dissolving into the briny surf. This is not over yet, she. I promise you will learn your lesson the hard way. Lukiat's seductive voice trails off, sailing away into the approaching storm. Within a few moments, the entire sky turns dark. She looks up and down the beach. There is a vast jungle beyond the shoreline. The water seems to have calmed for now, but the devastation is horrifying. Thousands of fish litter the sandy run. Some of them are still flopping about while others exhale their final breaths. Her heart aches to think that this happened because of her. She watches as the beached monster's shriveled carcass transforms into a puddle of silver fish that the languid tide drags back out to sea. Then, almost immediately after, the remnants of the horrid beast have been completely consumed by the sea, the waves begin to pick up again. A massive swell is fast building far offshore. She weeps a single tear that drops into the sand beside her, becoming a silver fish. Angrily, she slaps it into the ocean. Her ruby tail is glistening. She feels intense cramping in her lower regions. Pangs of discomfort, like growing pains, make her wince as her fluke splits in half and changes back into a pair of human legs. The blood that had formed her fishy appendage crawls up her body and takes to weaving itself around her again. This time, though, it manifests as a cape and a tunic with a hood. The texture of the plasma softens to the touch and separates like scales that are as delicate as rose petals. They overlap in ornately geometric patterns that fluctuate and disperse. The blood continues to dress her as she stands up. She is totally exhausted. Her legs wobble a bit at first, not yet reacclimated to firm ground. She brushes some sand off of Gleam and ponders the power of this so-called Dream Star. Well, that was a close one, eh? Grouper's voice sounds completely different above the water. She hadn't noticed the friendly face at first, amid all of the beached carnage. She rushes over to lift the illuminating fish, but it is cumbrous and far too heavy for her to move. She chokes back tears to avoid birthing any more of those troublesome silver fish. She becomes frantic. She can't let Grouper die. She has to at least save one of these unfortunate creatures. I've got to get you back in the water. Maybe my ring can make me stronger. She whimpers as she struggles to lift the girthy ichthyoid. Despite that it's shrinking, Grouper is still too heavy. No, 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 don't bother. I'm all washed up. Get it? <laughs> Grouper jokes, trying to make light of the situation. It's okay. I'm glad I was able to help you out. Now, take this stone from my headlamp. I want you to have it. That is my dream star. The more of these you gather, the closer you'll come to solving the riddle. Take it and head inland into the jungle. And whatever you do, don't look back. Thank you for saving my life, she says. Grouper lets out a deep sigh and the gem drops out of its headlamp and into her hand. It reduces in size, much as Grouper is, while she is holding it. 
This is like some kind of twisted fairy tale. All of those stories I've read have finally gone to my head. She is thinking this out loud when a sudden peal of thunder startles her and she springs to her feet. She spins around and stumbles off into the dense jungle. She is gaining ground and putting as much distance as possible between herself and the pursuing two-eyed storm. Hmm. Well now, that was exciting, wasn't it? I hope you enjoyed that chapter, and I look forward to delving deeper into this story with all of you next time. So until then, I wish you peace, love, and thunderstorms. Farewell, dreamers.